Good morning, everybody. Any uh, topics or issues people would like to raise before I get started? Questions from last week? Themes? Okay. Uh, we got started last week talking about uh, economics uh, and uh, talking about uh, the economics that uh, you have learned and that we are teaching normally today and a comparison, uh, at least a beginning of a comparison with other uh, philosophical and social traditions, uh, all to emphasize that there are some real issues about how we should think about the economy in terms of how it actually functions what it uh, results in in terms of human well-being and how it can be ordered or reoriented to achieve uh, higher well-being for the population. And that is uh, an ongoing theme of our work. How can a modern economy <laughs> that uh, takes advantage of our know-how and our advanced technologies also be designed not only to benefit from the wealth that we can create, but from other dimensions of human well-being so that we improve the overall functioning of our societies. For example, addressing the dire environmental crises that we face, addressing the shocking levels of inequality, the fact that poverty continues in the midst of plenty. Uh, and the fact that even for people that have material affluence, uh, they often lack uh, well-being in a uh, more general sense. They're not happy, uh, lives are not satisfying. And an economy, uh, an economic institution should aim for this broader conception of well-being. That's our theme and we started to discuss that last week. Today, I'm going to talk about a very basic idea of economics uh, and that is choice. That in an economy, uh, each of us makes choices all the time, how to spend our money, uh, whether to study in school or go to work, uh, whether to save or to borrow for the future. Uh, whether to give to charity or not give to charity. These are all choices. They're all of an economic character because they all involve material decisions, uh, decisions about money or about market transactions or about uh, the uh, uh, use of our possessions, uh, the role of our private property. Uh, we also make economic decisions as citizens when we vote for candidates. One candidate says cut taxes, the other candidate says raise taxes. When we make a vote uh, and decide between those two candidates, we're making an economic choice. So I want to talk about economic choices today. This week we have uh, labeled uh, uh, the topic as making good economic choices. Uh, and uh, I'll underscore the word good. Uh, what does it mean to make a good economic choice? In normal economics, uh, mainstream economics, as has been practiced for the last couple of hundred years, making a good economic choice means making the choice that would raise your well being uh, by, uh, according to your preferences, uh, your tastes, your will, uh, the kinds of things you like and want. And so the idea of making a good economic choice in mainstream economics is a technical one, uh, which is uh, how do you choose the uh, uh, range of commodities that you're going to buy, or how do you choose between saving and borrowing in order to <laughs> uh, maximize your utility. Uh, this is uh, the way that uh, we use the phrase. Um, 
and there's uh, not a lot of angst in this in mainstream economics in that individuals are so assumed to know what's good for them. We sometimes use the phrase consumer sovereignty. Uh, we're sovereigns over our uh, ourselves and our possessions, uh, and we know what's good for us, and we choose accordingly. And then a lot of economics studies how our individual choices lead to society-wide outcomes, how they create a national economy, whether that national economy has desirable features, whether it's wealthy, whether it's productive, whether it's efficient, and so forth. But the choice part is rather straightforward. We know what's good for us, and that's how we act. Uh, maybe uh, we are constrained in our actions because we're poor, but whether we're poor or we're rich, we do the best we can for ourselves, given our, our own preferences. And that uh, is uh, the definition uh, in the mainstream of economics for making a good choice. Oddly enough, that idea is uh, a very unusual idea, actually, in the sweep of uh, Western history. It's not how a psychologist would analyze human choices. It's not how a psychiatrist would analyze human choices. It's not how a neuroscientist would think about human choices. And it's certainly not how our theologians and moral uh, leaders and philosophers have thought about human choice. Uh, they have thought about human choice as much more of a struggle. Do we really know what's good for us? How can we find out what's good for us? Uh, how can we uh, uh, learn to make wise choices? How do we avoid temptation? How do we avoid mistakes? How do we avoid regret? A much more active, puzzling set of questions about making economic choices. So that's the theme of today's talk, looking at what is uh, typically uh, the kind of economic choices that we make, looking at how economics uh, in the mainstream talks about those choices, and then looking uh, under the cover uh, to see uh, a richer discussion about economic choices and what some of our philosophers have said about making choices and what a bit, because we'll spend more time on this uh, in future weeks, what modern science says about how we actually make choices, because it's not so simple uh, as saying, we know what's good for us and we choose what's the best. Uh, if life were that simple, uh, perhaps we would be doing a better job of uh, managing our lives and our society would be uh, having uh, better outcomes than we have. So I'm going to uh, show you uh, some basic ideas uh, around this, uh, and uh, then we will uh, have uh, some time for discussion. Okay, so here we are, making good economic choices. So here is a prototypical structure of an economic choice. Uh, in other words, a, a kind of a basic framework. We can choose between two different things. I'll call it C1 and C2, meaning choice one or choice two. And in economics, it's typical to say you can choose between C1 and C2 subject to a budget constraint. So in this sense, C1 and C2 could be thought of as the amount that you spend on good or service one and the amount that you spend on good or service two. It's your consumer choice, for example. And a typical way to think about that choice is to say you have a certain income, 
I'll call it Y, letter Y, because that's the letter that we traditionally use for income. And there is a price for each unit of C1, and there is a price for each unit of the second good. So P1 times C1 is the actual amount that you're spending on that first commodity. P2 times C2 is the amount that you're spending on the second commodity. And together, that adds up to your income. The choice is how much should you spend on C1 versus spending on C2 subject to your budget constraint. This is what uh, economics calls uh, basic consumer theory. And I'm sure that many of you have seen this before. So again, think of C1 as the quantity that you're spending on uh, good one and C2, the quantity that you're spending on good two. The prices uh, times the quantities are the uh, dollar values that you're uh, spending. Those dollar values add up to your budget, uh, which is uh, your, your income. And the question is how to analyze that choice. So graphically, we can write the budget constraint as a downward sloping line in a, the normal uh, economics uh, framework. You put uh, the first commodity measured on the x-axis or the horizontal axis, the second commodity on the vertical axis. And if you rewrite the budget constraint, you can get the line shown uh, at the top of the slide, that the uh, number of units of C2 that you can buy equals uh, income divided by the price of that second good minus P1 over P2 times the amount of consumption of the first good that you buy. There's a trade-off. The more you spend on C1, the less you get of C2. The less you spend of C2, of C1, the more you uh, can buy C2. And that leads to a budget line, which is the downward sloping line. So the uh, budget line hits the vertical axis, uh, the Y axis, at the point Y over P2. It says, that if I don't spend any money on the first good and put all my budget to the second good, I can buy Y divided by P2 units of the second good. If on the other hand, I wanna use all my money to spend on the first good, uh, then it, the uh, uh, budget line uh, uh, is, uh, um, shown where it hits the X axis, the horizontal axis, and I can spend, uh, if C2 is zero, I can buy Y over P1 units of the first good. In general, I'm gonna want both. I'm gonna want some amount of the second good and some amount of the first good. So I'm going to want to choose some intermediate position on this budget line. And that is economic choice in its paradigmatic form. So there are many choices on that budget line. Uh, if I uh, look at the point on the budget line to the Northwest, uh, the higher up uh, dot shown here, that would be consistent with buying more of C2 and less of C1 or the uh, point in the uh, southeast of uh, the budget line, that would be buying more of C1 and less of C2. An individual that has a strong preference for the second commodity would be choosing the higher point. An individual with a strong preference for the first commodity would be choosing the 
the uh, lower point on this budget constraint. And that would constitute the economic choice. So in mainstream economics, the way that uh, this choice is described is by saying that individuals have a preference function or a utility function that measures their well-being or their felicity or their utility depending on how much they are consuming of their choices of C1 and C2. A typical kind of utility function is the one that I show in green here. This is just a uh, algebraic example. It says that for this individual, the utility or the well-being that this individual is assumed to uh, obtain from consumption of C1 and C2 is given by a particular function. We call it a, a Cobb-Douglas function in this case, uh, named after the originators. But you can see in this example, and it's nothing more than an example, it's C1 to the alpha times C2 to the one minus alpha. So that's the assumed utility function. And the idea is that since that's what the individual uh, uh, obtains in well-being or utility, choose the level of C1 and C2 that will lead to the highest utility. That is a technical issue. The individual says, well, this is my taste. This is my preference. Uh, now, how much of C1 should I choose and how much of C2 should I choose? And in this kind of utility function, alpha is a number between zero and one. If alpha is one, then uh, what is the utility, uh, by the way? if alpha is one, can somebody say it? I can't see you because I'm sharing the screen, but can someone just shout it out? Are you there? Okay, so can someone shout out if alpha equals one and that is your utility function, uh, what would your utility function be? Just plug alpha into that equation, alpha equals one into the top equation, what would, uh, what, what would you, uh, um, oops. Jeff, I think you uh, stopped sharing the screen. Oh, sorry, okay, you're completely correct. There we go. Okay, uh, can you see that? Somebody say yes, yes? Yes. Yes. Good, okay, now you see the equation, yes? Yes. Okay. Plug alpha equals one. What would the utility function be? C1. It would just be C1 because C2 would be to the power zero, which is one. So in the case that alpha is equal to one, what would the consumer choose to do? What choice would the individual make? Spend uh, their money only on C1. Great. What if uh, alpha is equal to zero? What would the utility function be? C2. C2, exactly, because it would be C1 to the zero power, C2 to the first power. If utility equals C2, what would the individual choose to do? Buy only C2. Exactly, buy only C2. So if alpha is something between zero and one, what will the individual choose to do? Uh, a mix between the two. Good. The individual will choose to buy a, a mix between the two. How much, the individual says, scratching her head, how much should I buy? And she says, I know, I'll use calculus. Isn't that what you would do? Standing in the market? 
So uh, what you would do is say my utility U is equal to C1 to the alpha, C2 to the one minus alpha, and I want to choose the best level of C1. And my budget constraint is that C2 can be rewritten as a function of C1 because of the budget line. I know that C2 is nothing other than Y over P2 minus P1 over P2 times C1. So I can put for C2 in the utility function that uh, budget constraint. And now I can write in the second line here utility as a function only of C1. You see what I've done? You have to say yes, or I can't move forward. Or yeah. say no. What are you talking about? Yes. Do people see? Yes. You can, you can unmute for the moment. I need to hear. Yes. Okay. So I've rewritten the utility function as a function of just C1 and then some other fixed things that I as a consumer don't control, my total income and the prices of the two commodities. And when you maximize a utility function or when you maximize any function, according to calculus, you take the derivative, oh, and I have a typo here, uh, that should be C1, sorry. Uh, you take the derivative of the utility function according to the variable and it reaches its maximum value when the first derivative equals zero. Is that familiar to everybody? Yeah. So yeah. technically speaking, to choose how much of C1 and C2 to buy, I need to use calculus. And that's what I've done in this slide. I've used the chain rule and I uh, won't go through the calculation now, uh, but I've set the derivative of the utility function equal to zero. And when I solve for that, lo and behold, with this utility function, I find out something quite nice and quite interesting. That's why we use it all the time. When I go through the algebra, I end up with these two equations shown on the next slide, highlighted in yellow. It says P1 times C1 equals alpha times Y, and P2 times C2 equals one minus alpha times Y. Could someone put that in words for me? What does it mean, P1 times C1? What is P1 times C1? Is it the price of the good times the quantity? Yeah, so what is it? It's the amount that I'm spending on the first commodity, right? Yes. Okay. What is P2 times C2? It would be the amount I'm spending on the second good. Good. And what is alpha times Y? Remember that alpha is a number between zero and one. It is how much of my total income I'm spending on that good. Beautiful. Okay. So what can somebody uh, summarize uh, what I've derived, even though I haven't gone through uh, the algebra? What is the conclusion? How am I going to allocate my budget? What do I find the best way to allocate my budget assuming that utility function? What should I do? Should I spend alpha of my total income on the first good and one minus alpha on the second good, is that what you mean? That's it. So what uh, we've derived for this utility function 
is that I should spend a fraction of my budget on good one alpha and a, another fraction of uh, my budget, the, the rest of my budget on good two. What if alpha is equal to one? How much should I spend on good one? What share of my budget? Let's go back to screen sharing. If, if alpha is equal to one, how much should I spend on the first good? 100%. 100%. How much should I spend on the second good? Zero. Right. Does that make sense intuitively? Yes. Because when alpha equals one, what was my utility function? Do you remember? It was just C equals C2. No, when alpha C1. equals one, what was the utility function? C1. 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 So, so if alpha equals one, what should I spend my money on? Should I spend my money on C2 if I only like C1? No. No. So intuitively, calculus works. It says if alpha is equal to one, spend everything on C1. If alpha is equal to zero, spend everything on C2. And if alpha is somewhere in between, spend a share, a part on C1 and a part on C2. And then given that, I can write a second relationship, which shows that actually for a given set of prices, C2 is just a, in a linear relationship with C1. So C2 is some proportion of C1. It's a line. And so lo and behold, that second relationship is helpful because now I can use my graphical analysis. The downward sloping line is my budget constraint. And I've just derived preferences that show that the best that I can do is to make C2 equal to one minus alpha over alpha times P1 over P2 times C1. Ah, but that's a line starting at the origin and rising with a slope one minus alpha over alpha times P1 over P2. That's this upward sloping line depending on what alpha is. And my best choice then, my economic choice, is where my preferences hit my budget constraint. That's the mainstream economic theory. It says you've got a budget constraint, you have a choice of what to do, you have a set of preferences, you maximize your utility based on those preferences. And lo and behold, you come up with a formula. And in this case, because I chose the utility function to be of a particular form, the preferences are of a particular form. Allocate a share of my budget to the first good and, another, and the rest of the budget to the second good. So that gives me a theory of how the consumer will behave, but only if I know the preferences are really of the form C1 to the alpha, C2 to the one minus alpha. But if so, and if the individual behaves by maximizing utility, then the choice is at the intersection of the preference line and the budget constraint. Voila, that's basic economic choice in mainstream economic theory. And you can do all sorts of fun things with that. You can say, okay, what if I get richer? What happens? So suppose that the price ratios don't change and suppose that the alpha doesn't change but the Y goes up. In that case, the budget line shifts outward from the original budget line to the higher budget line. My preferences 
continue to be the same defined by that linear relationship between C2 and C1, the line from the origin going in the northeast direction. And when I'm richer, I get to consume more of both goods. And so my choice is to consume more of both goods, but keeping my consumption in the same proportion. So what's the conclusion there? That shows uh, how consumption of C1 and C2 would change with income. And if I track back to the utility function, aha, I'm happier. Wealth is good. Basic bottom line, more. I get to consume more. And if I plug back in to the formula for utility, which I didn't do, but I'll add that uh, to the slide, my utility goes up when Y goes up. Bravo, nice to be rich. That's why Adam Smith wrote the book, The Wealth of Nations. Because if you have more Y, you have more C1 and you have more C2. And that makes you happier. And your preferences define uh, how you will spend the added funds. Okay. So that is the basic theory. And you can use the same apparatus to ask other questions. What happens if the price of good two declines, for example? So uh, the iPhone 19 becomes cheaper. What, what do we do then? Well, the budget constraint shifts and the preference line shift. And with this particular set of preferences, this Cobb-Douglas utility function, what happens is your consumption of C2 rises, but the consumption of C1 doesn't change. So with this particular set of preferences, if one good becomes cheaper, you buy more of that good to keep the proportion of your budget that you're spending on that good unchanged. And the amount that you spend on the other good doesn't change at all. That's particular to this utility function, but it shows that you can use this framework to ask questions. How would the consumer <coughs> respond <coughs> to a higher income <coughs> or to a lower price? <coughs> and if you are an economist working for Apple and uh, Tim Cook says, what price should we set the uh, iPhone 19 at? Uh, you do the calculations to ask how much would consumers buy at different prices. And this is what the consumer theory would predict. So, so far, so good. Just not all that accurate, but so far, so good. Uh, so... Let's consider uh, a typical kind of choice uh, that you face uh, at dinner time, uh, or I face at dinner time at least. So I want to know: Should I eat uh, more broccoli or have an extra piece of cake? Uh, and uh, I know my utility function, what's good for me, uh, and I. Uh, find the intersection between these two goods. And uh, I plan my dinner accordingly. And then I stand uh, in front of the refrigerator and I think, mm, mm -hmm. yeah, that's the best thing for me, but I'd really like that extra piece of cake. Uh, you know, it's probably not good for me, but I probably uh, just tonight, uh, it would be a good idea. So we all face the choice between what is good for our utility and maybe uh, what we're tempted to do. And that idea that what is good for us and what 
is tempting for us might not be the same thing is, I would say, probably the most standard idea about choices that we face in our lives, but is ruled out of economics by assumption. That idea that there might be something different of what is our utility and what is our temptation isn't even considered in economics because what is our temptation is our utility in economic theory, no distinction. But in our lives, at least for me, uh, that extra bit of cake looks awfully good, uh, but I know it's really not what I should uh, be choosing. And that becomes a very relevant distinction in uh, our lives. We make New Year's resolutions. We have to make decisions every day. We make life decisions that are more complicated because we're tempted to do something, but we also feel that we probably should do something else. And so we don't feel internally like we have one utility function. We feel at a minimum like we have two utility functions, uh, something that's telling us do this and something else that's telling us to do that. That is what economic choice has uh, been facing and what moral philosophers and psychologists and now neuroscientists have been grappling with, I would say for 2000 years, that we don't feel completely unified in our heads. We feel all sorts of choices. We don't know which way to go. We don't know what's really good for us. We don't understand why we should do this, but we feel like doing something else. Sometimes we're not even sure why we did something else. We try to figure it out. Why did I ever choose that? That was really stupid. Or I knew I shouldn't have done that. I did it again, darn it. And that is very consequential for real life, not just for economic theory. So I would say on almost every kind of economic choice we face, we confront a cake versus fat vegetable uh, phenomenon. And sometimes we describe this as saying our utility or what's good for us is that point at the intersection of our preference line and our budget line but because we lack willpower, we end up choosing another uh, point on, uh, that uh, isn't as good for us. We just don't have the self-control that we should have. We were tempted to do something, even though it really wasn't for our good. And this is not a small problem. This is actually a pervasive problem in society in a way possibly getting much worse in the 20th century. That's a strange thing to say because human beings are uh, biologically not changed over the last few thousand years in any meaningful way. But it could be that the temptation structures that we face in our lives are changing. And a term that we use for Choosing the wrong point on the line is addiction. And it does seem that there's lots of evidence that we are addicted to many things. So uh, a leading uh, uh, nutritionists uh, say that we are addicted to sugar that is added to our uh, processed foods and the uh, Breakfast cereal makers sure know how to add sugar to the Fruit Loops and the Frosted Flakes. I don't know about you, but I, I like that stuff. They uh, have put sugar in it, and there's good reason to believe from a neuroscience point of view that the sugar is physically addictive. And then some people are addicted to gambling. 
you don't understand it, but people gamble when they don't have the income to do so. They end up losing their families. They end up losing their homes. They end up in ruin because they can't stop their gambling. And then millions, tens of millions of people are addicted to chemical substances. And we in the United States are in the midst of an opioid epidemic, uh, which came through the development of uh, pain relievers that were highly addictive. And if you read the newspapers each day, uh, companies are paying billions of dollars and the Sackler family is paying billions of dollars, but in my view, not enough billions of dollars because they're left with billions of dollars for deliberately addicting Americans to these painkillers and ruining millions of lives. They did it by giving kickbacks to doctors to prescribe drugs that got patients addicted to these medicines. Really shameful. The patients didn't know what was right for them. Their doctors were telling them. They ended up addicted to drugs and thereby uh, spending a large budget and a lot of mental anguish on a behavior taking these opioids that they don't want, but they can't stop. Some people are addicted to shopping. They know that they've maxed out on their credit cards. They can't afford things, but I don't feel good today. I want to go to the store and buy something. And that is an addiction. And there is more and more evidence that social media are addictive. A lot of people are addicted to TikTok or to their screen time or to their Facebook page or to their likes. Uh, and the painful point about all of these is that not only are these addictions real, meaning that individuals are making choices because of lack of willpower. They're not at their point of well-being and they know it and they're suffering because of it. But if you look at these addictions, there's something even more wrong with our society, which is that these are addictions not because of weakness of individuals, but because of an industry that is promoting addictions actively because it's good for their business. So the sugar addiction isn't something we stumbled into because of what's called the thrifty calorie, that uh, I, the idea being that as hunters and gatherers, we tried to consume every calorie we could because we could never be sure where the next meal was coming from. Now that we're rich, we eat too much. It's not that. It's that the food processing industry knows that if they put added sugar and process the flour and put in some other ingredients, they'll get more customers. And the people who run, uh, 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 run the casinos know how to keep the lighting and the lack of windows and the lack of uh, clocks on the wall so that people are unaware of the normal diurnal cues to tell them it's time to leave. And uh, the opioids, as I mentioned, were a deliberate concoction of addiction. And we know about social media that Google and Facebook hired experts to test how to keep our eyes on the screen, how to use the like button and other buttons to make sure that there, it was more screen time because if they could sell to advertisers higher screen time, they could make more money. And so these are addictions that were by design. So what is an addiction? An addiction is very different from economic theory. An addiction is when preferences change over time because of the mental uh, and uh, neurological circuitry of our brains. Uh, individuals then make choices that they consciously, that is self-reflectively, 
with self-awareness that they resist. They try not to behave that way, but they can't stop themselves. So it's like a battle going on in the head. And it's literally different brain circuits competing with each other for an outcome. And addiction leads to great unhappiness, to regret, sometimes even to suicides. So none of that is in economic choice theory. And if it were to be mentioned in mainstream economics, you would say, well, that's an exception. But it's not an exception. It's maybe half of society today in one way or another. There are many implications about how we organize an economy. We should not be uh, encouraging the consumption of addictive substances or behaviors. Children who, because of brain development, don't have the protective circuitry to guard against addiction are especially vulnerable. And there is profound danger of hidden manipulation and advertising. We don't even know how we're being manipulated. So this is an example where mainstream consumer theory really goes wrong. Now, let me mention many other kinds of economic choices that we'll talk about. Another choice is leisure time versus work time. And here the trade-off is how much income you can earn versus how much leisure or even sleep uh, time you can have. And again, it's the same structure. Uh, the more income you make, the less leisure. The more leisure, the lower income. There's a balance between the well-being that you derive from your income and the well-being that you derive from your leisure. And the balance would lead to the point, the choice in the middle, just same structure as the previous problem. But the temptation, strangely enough, in our culture in America is less leisure or even less sleeping time because we are a sleep deprived nation in order to have more income. Why could that be the outcome? Not because work is addictive, most likely, but in part because of what at least used to be called the rat race, because you have to keep up with others. So if everybody would like to work a little bit less uh, and enjoy more leisure, but everybody is afraid that their colleague with whom they're competing is just working a little bit more. And it leads everybody to have an outcome that everybody would prefer to change and uh, over work. Some countries deal with this by having national guaranteed holiday time. Actually in, of course, in, ancient Israel for a slightly different reason, but it's not unrelated. The Sabbath was guaranteed to everybody, slave and slave owner alike, at least one day off. So the idea of the work leisure trade-off, having a social component, social influence is very important. When I talked about individual choice at the beginning, the mainstream economic model, there is no social pressure on choice. Individuals have preferences, they have a budget constraint, and they maximize utility. But just like addiction can lead away from well-being, social pressure can also affect economic choices. And one of the areas where it's likely to do that is in the work leisure trade-off. The United States ends up working longer hours than our European counterparts, but according to psychology studies, our European counterparts are happier with their lives than Americans on average. So something to think about. Another kind of 
choice is between the present and the future. So I could think about C2 being consumption in the future and C1 as being consumption today. And we have what we call an intertemporal economic choice. How do we balance consumption today in the future? And you might ask, well, do I really have a choice? How much to consume today and how much to consume in the future? The answer is yes. If you save some of your income today, it means you're consuming less today and you can use your savings account for more consumption in the future. If you borrow from the bank today or on your credit card, then you are consuming more today, but will have to consume less in the future. So we all face this kind of intertemporal choice. And it has the same structure as choosing between two goods at one time. Again, you might have a preference function that defines how future consumption relates to present consumption. You have a budget constraint, which in this case is a so-called intertemporal budget constraint. And the best thing to do for you, your highest well-being, is the point in the middle again. But there can be another kind of temptation, which is, I know I shouldn't max out on my credit card debt, but I couldn't help myself. And that is, I couldn't delay my gratification. Saving for the future is self-control. Self-control is a brain function, a mental function, but it can be overridden by temptation. And so just like the problem of addiction, there is a problem of self-regulation to stop overspending in the present to uh, have enough income in the future. Now, it's an interesting question. Uh, is our market economy well organized to help us to save? When you go into a shop, do they say to you, ah, maybe you really shouldn't buy this right now? Are you thinking about the future? Or do they uh, show you all the possible merchandise? And would you like this with your order? So we are constantly tempted to overspend, just like we're constantly tempted with addictive goods. And so our intertemporal choices are very difficult to control. Same exact structure, again, that we may want the point in the middle of this graph, but we end up with the point to the lower uh, southeast point, more present consumption, less future consumption. We call this the problem of delayed gratification. Some of you have studied the marshmallow problem in psychology. The child is told, if you don't eat the marshmallow right now, and wait a few minutes till I come back, you can have two marshmallows. And the marshmallow test is used by psychologists to see whether children have self-regulation long enough to be able to delay their gratification. And it turns out if you give the marshmallow test to a four-year-old, that is rather predictive of how they're going to do in high school uh, because uh, Everything about uh, studying and working hard is a matter of self-control and self-regulation. And so this is actually a psychological trait. Interestingly, it's a psychological trait that can be developed, actually. So it can be built upon. It can be strengthened. Our society does not strengthen it very much we uh, tend to uh, try to diminish it. Come on, buy another one. But in fact, uh, developing that self-regulation could raise well-being. So that's another kind of intertemporal choice.
I think that's it, yes. Um, here's another kind of choice. How much for us versus how much for charity? So we have a budget and we have a choice. We can use for ourselves or we can give some for charity. And we well know that we should be giving some for charity. And there are many religious principles for doing that. And the golden rule emphasizes do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Uh, and that includes helping the poor, because if you were in that situation, that's what you would have others uh, do unto you. But when it comes to the choice between consumption and charity, well, there is the best point in the middle, and there is the temptation point to the southeast once again. Ah, uh, yeah, I should give to charity, but I really want uh, that uh, ex extra uh, piece of clothing, whatever it is. Uh, and so this is another case where there's a different kind of choice. Let's call it a choice between selfishness and a term that we'll use a lot in the coming weeks, pro-sociality, meaning behaving for the benefit of others in society or you could say it's behaving according to the golden rule. So behaving according to the golden rule requires some self-regulation, some self-control. And just like the choice between cake and vegetables, between consuming today and consuming for the future, we have a choice between consuming for us and helping others. And that requires pro-sociality, but it needs to be cultivated. There's another kind of choice that we'll study, and that's the choice between safety and some measured risk. Because we can choose something that's absolutely safe, or something that has some risk attached to it. It turns out that we have not only normal risk aversion, that is we prefer not to have risk when we can, but we have also uh, difficulties of making mental judgments about how much risk to, uh, to accept. And so even if the proper balance for us is something like the middle, we have what psychologists call loss aversion, which actually distorts our thinking and makes us take outcomes that are perhaps, perhaps too safe in a way. And we'll study some of these consequences as well. I'm not going to elaborate on this right now because it would take us uh, too far afield for the moment. So let me uh, bring all of these ideas together to say that I've talked about a number of economic choices, how much of particular goods and services to consume. That was our first example. Whether to uh, spend now or spend in the future, intertemporal choice our work-life balance between work time, sleep, and leisure, a third kind of decision. Our choices between spending on ourselves and spending on others, our pro-sociality choice, decisions about uncertainty. And the point about all of these, these are all structurally related choices. And for all of them, neoclassical economics or mainstream economics makes a certain set of assumptions. The assumptions are that we have well-defined preferences. They're stable, complete, and transitive, technically. These preferences are given for each of us. We each have our own tastes. We make our choice based on those preferences. And the course we choose is the best for us. 
These are the assumptions of mainstream economics. Stable preferences, individually set preferences, and utility maximization. We choose what is best for us. I have to say, when I learned that, I won't tell you how long ago, I thought, well, that's so basic, so intuitive, of course. But not only is it not intuitive, it's not right. <laughs> because as I've been explaining, this is not how we make our choices. Our preferences are not stable. They are changing over time. They are socially influenced. We do not choose on the basis of a single utility function. Our choices are much more complex and often much more conflicted. And so often we choose what's not best for us. And that makes all of the economics more complicated. In economics, uh, it became popular to use a Latin phrase, gustibus non est disputandum. Tastes are not for arguing. In other words, if I want to spend all my money on heroin or all my money on gambling or uh, all my money on myself, that's my taste. That's not for debate. Uh, my taste, gustibus, non est, is not for debate, disputandum. And this, I think, is a very uh, strange idea because our tastes are not well-defined and they change over time. And so the question is why and how, and what does that mean for our well-being? So in general, our moral philosophers, our ethicists, our theologians, and now our psychologists and our neuroscientists have quite different ideas about preferences than mainstream economics. And Aristotle uh, is a starting point for us. And he and most moralists in Western civilization, oops, Western civilization. Sorry. I was gonna just, oh, sorry about that. I uh, have had a very different idea about preferences. So Aristotle had an insight uh, that uh, was very interesting. He didn't know any technical neuroscience. He didn't even know the role of the brain, uh, actually. But he did sense that our, our psychological uh, apparatus, uh, what he called our soul or our psyche, it was divided. It had different, uh, it had, it had different uh, uh, faculties, they called them, different components. And he said, we had an animal psyche and a human or a rational part of our soul. So Aristotle said we were divided in our choices. Animals react to stimuli and they have instincts and they don't think about the future. And humans have rational thought and the ability to control our instincts. But Aristotle said controlling our instincts is a great battle. So we don't necessarily choose for the good. We have to learn how to choose for the good. That's a very important idea and a very strange idea to economics. Because in economics, maybe you have to learn calculus, but other than that, you don't have to learn how to choose for the good. But for Aristotle and for most of moral philosophy, over the next 2,300 years, learning to choose for the good was a core part of our role as human beings. And Aristotle and the ancient Greeks used a Greek term called phronesis. The Latins called it prudentia, which means practical wisdom to choose for the good. So for Aristotle, he would say, of course, there are 
is the point in the middle of the graph where it's best for you. Of course, there is the animal temptation lower down on your budget constraint to choose the immediate, to choose the addictive, uh, to, uh, uh, in other words, uh, behave for uh, instant gratification. And you need to learn over time, first self-control, which the Greeks called enkratia, and you have to learn the wisdom of how to make good choices for a happy life, which the Greeks called phronesis or practical wisdom. So it turns out that even though economics tells you the first day, you have a utility function, maximize it, and that's what you do. Most of Western philosophy, psychology, and neuroscience has held that we don't have a single set of preferences, but we have competing preferences. And this shows up in many, many different variants over 2,300 years. Aristotle emphasized the difference of instinct versus rational. Paul and Augustine emphasized the difference of uh, the temptations of the body versus uh, the desires of the spirit or the flesh versus the spirit. But one could say the instinctual uh, or the uh, stimulus response part versus the rational part. Of course, uh, theologians talk about choosing the good versus choosing evil. Psychologists talk about conscious choices versus unconscious choices. Freud, in his psychology a hundred years ago, talked about the ego, the id, and the superego. The ego was more or less uh, like our utility function. The id was that voice inside of you saying, eat that extra piece of cake. Don't leave the gambling table. Uh, have that uh, w one more uh, uh, hit of your uh, favorite addiction. And the superego for Freud was the arbiter, the referee that said, uh, playing the parental role, id, stop it, let the ego do the right thing. So Freud had also a divided mind theory that we don't have a single choice, we have a division of our mind, just like Aristotle thought. And then uh, other psychologists like uh, Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel laureate, says we have two neural kinds of circuitry, fast circuitry, which is mostly uh, instinctive, and slow circuitry, which is mostly uh, the uh, conscious part of our thinking. Consciousness burns a lot of calories, takes a lot of time, makes your brain tired, literally. Whereas your fast circuitry, your instinctive choice says, go for the cake. And that fast versus slow choice determines our outcomes. Neuroscientists talk about a different division. They talk about top-down control versus bottom-up control of our neural circuitry. What do they mean about top-down control? Technically, they mean the part of the brain that is uh, uh, just behind the forehead, the prefrontal cortex, which supposedly is like our CEO function, our chief executive function. And the bottom-up part of the brain is what's called uh, the subcortical or mid brain components of emotion and of instinctual learning, uh, what is called uh, the amygdala uh, or the uh, uh, striatum that encodes a lot of instinctual or learned behavior where we have learned a response to a stimulus. 
like taking opioids or more gambling or that wonderful sugar added to our breakfast. And the idea of the neuroscientists is that we have multiple brain circuits and we need to exercise top-down or prefrontal cortex or executive function control to keep our learned or instinctive or stimulus response mechanisms under rational control. Not so different from what Aristotle said uh, 2,350 years ago. So turning back to Aristotle and I'll end here, uh, he thought that rational behavior needs to be cultivated. In other words, you don't just learn to choose the right thing or to stop temptation. You have to develop the skill, the excellence, the virtue of choosing right, the virtue of phronesis. And he said the way to do it was to choose the moderate path. Not too much cake, not too little cake. Choose something in between. And this was Greek wisdom inscribed in the temple at Delphi in the famous phrase, medan agon, nothing in excess. And Freud said virtue, which is the Greek meaning excellent, has the meaning of excellence. Virtue is the golden mean between two vices, one that is too much and the other is too little, or as translated, one that is excess and one that is deficiency. And so he listed what is the virtuous middle path, and you can study this table, what is too much, what is too little, and what is just right. So kind of a Goldilocks theory of choosing the right thing, choosing the middle course. And that middle course became what became known as the cardinal virtues. The cardinal virtues are uh, fortitude, uh, being brave but not recklessly so, temperance, being moderate in our desires, justice, being fair to others, and prudence or phronesis, making good, wise, moral judgments. And in Christian uh, thought for 2,000 years, the four moral virtues that uh, the Greeks emphasized were combined with the three religious virtues, faith, charity, and hope, to be the seven virtues. But the idea of virtue is to be virtuous means to cultivate excellence. And one of the excellences that needs to be cultivated is the excellence of making good choices, something completely foreign from the idea of current economics. I'll stop here. How did Aristotle think we could become virtuous? To live ethically, meaning to live in a way that would produce a good life. And he turned to the Greek word ethos, which actually means habit, not just ethical. And so he said, how to become virtuous? Practice, practice, practice. Behave virtuously. Over time, that will help you to develop the self-control. And he said, have good mentors, good education, and live in a virtuous society, not in an addictive society, not in a manipulative society, but in a virtuous society. And uh, we have run out of time, but as I've hinted at, uh, this idea of uh, cultivating virtue has a lot of resonance with modern neuroscience, which says we have multiple brain pathways, instinctual pathways and uh, rational, cognitive, self-aware pathways, mainly the prefrontal 
cortex or PFC shown in the brain here. And we need to make sure that our prefrontal cortex is operating to regulate our activities and telling us, don't fall prey to the temptation, stay the middle course. Otherwise, when the prefrontal cortex isn't working properly, then we fall prey to addiction and to other uh, breakdowns of our choices. So this is uh, uh, a very quick overview of what economics says about choice, what uh, our much larger moral and scientific tradition says, but I think you can already see this makes a difference for us because it gives a very different idea about how we're going to organize economic life to have a good life. And that is taking into account how we're wired so that uh, we behave in ways and make choices in ways that are good for us and good for others. Let's uh, stop there. Tony will pick up on Friday and uh, everybody stay well and uh, see you next time. Thank you, Thank Professor. You. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Have a great Thank week. You, you too. You.